Christ is risen. May God's great alleluia resound deeply in your heart. May the power of God which brought forth Christ from the tomb overflow into your life. May the joy of the resurrection claim you today. Alleluia. Each gospel offers a different view on who precisely comes to Jesus' grave early Sunday morning. For John, Mary Magdalene travels alone, setting off while it is still dark. In Matthew, she is joined by another Mary, the mother of James. Mark's gospel account adds to the two Marys a third traveler, Salome. Luke begins his resurrection witness with a simple they. They arrive at the tomb as the deep shadows of night give way to the breaking dawn. They are a group of women who have traveled with Jesus since his days in Galilee providing companionship and financial support. Luke gives names to three of them, but the group is likely larger. Women who accompany Jesus to Jerusalem, who walk behind him as he carries his cross, who pray through their tears while watching him die, and are now tasked with preparing his body for burial. Joanna is among the group of tomb visitors, and all we know about her is her husband's name, Chusa, and his role, an officer in Herod's court. Joanna has left her home in Galilee, trading the protection of kingly connection for an itinerant life, swapping the security of her husband's position for the risky love of God. I imagine Joanna as young and gutsy and independent, but maybe she's weathered by the years and mature, steadily ready for a more truthful life. What we don't know creates space between the Marys, Joanna, and the unnamed ones for us to go with them to the garden, seeking Jesus whom they have cared for, for so long. Graves are good places to go when you are grieving. They offer space to sit, think, and watch the wind whistle through the trees. Grave sites offer time to adjust to a new reality, to stare into the gaping hole where once a living, loving person accompanied you. Graves are good places to go when you need to cry, recount your memories, speak a word to the one you have loved and lost. Friday night's burial was a hasty one, a temporary wrapping intended only to contain the body for a day. A final preparation of Jesus with entombment spices fell to the women, entrusted with a tender task. Except he is not here. No body lays unfolded in grave clothes. No stone secures the tomb. Instead, there are angels dazzling with brightness, asking why we are looking for the living among the dead. The first words of resurrection come as this unsettling question. Why are you here? You're in the wrong place. And while the Gospels disagree about who comes to the grave, they all agree that these first witnesses are shocked by what they do not find. 
Jesus is not dead, defeated, or destroyed. You will not find the Lord lying lifeless in a sealed off room. Do not look for him to be attached to a gravestone marker titled, What Might Have Been. He is not here. He has been raised. And so to prove their message, the angels ask the women to remember. Remember. Remember the love that sang at Jesus' birth. Remember him commanding the storm to stop. Remember the day on the hillside when hungry bellies were filled. Remember him speaking of the high cost of his love. In Luke's gospel, to remember God is a saving act. Remember. I imagine the women stood there with spices falling from their hands, knees buckling to the ground, faces smacking the dirt, and then they did remember all the strange and glorious moments they had shared with Christ. Not only the good, beautiful times when love was so thick you could touch it, but also his terrible death, his agonizing breathing, the ways the crowds jeered and the disciples fled and the sun refused to shine. To remember before God is to transform the meaning of the memory from God forsaken to God soaked, from certain defeat to undefeatable life. This is resurrection, when we survey the grave sides of our lives and remember the promises of faith, and then see anew the imprints of God's presence stamped across our days. When the women tell the disciples that Jesus has been raised, the group scoff at the idea. They cannot remember, and women are not to be believed. Resurrection is preposterous, unimaginable, an idiotic dream. When Pilate hands down a death sentence, well, then the end has come. When fear and power conspire together, well, then the dream does die. When the grave is sealed, there is no opening it. Sure, we wanted a better ending, the disciples might have said, but all of us saw his broken body. What you speak is but an idle tale. And yet, Peter sees the unused spices. He hears the hope in the women's voices. He senses that something has happened. So he journeys to the graveside to see for himself, and there he finds the tomb empty, the grave cloth carefully folded, new life whiffing through the air. Months later, he will preach this resurrection truth. They put him to death on a tree, he says, but God raised him on the third day. But God is the sermon of Easter Sunday. These two words capture our resurrection faith. The world continues in all its tragedy, terror, and death, and we would be captive to its forces. But God works for life. You thought you were defeated, strung out by disappointment, dead end choices. But God raised you up, empowered you forward, and set you upon a new path. You thought
thought you had failed, squandered your last chance. But God made a way out of no way. They put him to death, but God raised him, preached Peter. And the power of our living Christ calls to each of us out of all our graves, away from a mourning-only kind of life into a hope-filled one, created by the power contained in two tiny words, but God. Without God, all was lost. All is lost. But God lives. So Easter people lean into this truth. Jesus has left the tomb. The world is alive with his presence, and he is seeking out us to raise us into his glorious life. Claim the option for life, the but God variable, a power always at work, ever available to you. Amen.